actually that is the key of a wonderful conversation is the that it happens so spontaneously and so unexpectedly and so unprepared uh, and so beautifully and magically between people. It is that. It's mm -hmm. not the setup. It's mm -hmm. the it's the spontaneity it of it. Mm. That often those ones are the ones that change our our complete trajectory in our lives because we'll be going one way and then we'll have a conversation that was completely unplanned and we'll be like, I've never thought of it that way. And, mm. oh, I don't know you see the world like that. That's so interesting. And suddenly our lives are looking different. It's, so I'm glad you're taking this thing around. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah I'm trying to have more of those, those conversations uh, that count that way, actually, mm. as you say, get us to think differently because that's how we yeah. change and grow. Yeah. Let's talk communication. Today with Desiree Clark on feminism. Welcome to Let's Talk Communication with me, Talana Simpson. So as I go on my journey of exploring how to have more meaningful conversations in my life, I got the opportunity to have quite a spontaneous one with Desiree Clark a while ago. It touched me so much and I enjoyed the conversation and learned so much that I asked Desiree if we could have another conversation specifically around the topic of feminism in today's world and how we need to be having more conversations with both men and women about what feminism is. Desiree is a leadership development specialist and lectures in the field of women leadership and gender issues. And as I continue experimenting, learning and sharing through these podcasts, I hope you'll enjoy the conversation that I had with Desiree. I really wanted to have with you um, was really around gender inequality and, and feminism because part of what I'm really passionate yeah. about is having conversations that count and what I mean by that is as we said like mm. those kind of conversations that that shift things not only in terms of our own thinking and and behaving but or when we shift we we change the context that you know we, we the ripple effects will affect yeah. the people around us so so as an example of a conversation that counts is for me is one around feminism. Mm -hmm. So I know you're also very passionate about yeah. this, this topic and especially the aspects that we want to, want to explore with you today. So maybe just to start off with it is how do you define feminism? Because it's a very misunderstood kind of concept today. Yeah, so my definition mostly is based on my academic understanding of it and my experience of it. And it's around, when I explain it to people, the way I explain it is, imagine Steve, what Steve Biko said about being black, about just being proud of being black. And it's not anti-white, it's just proud of being black. Feminism is like that for, for women. It's around just be proud of being a woman. It's not anti-male, it's not anti-anything. It's just be okay to be a woman. That's one part of it. The one part of mm -hmm. just being the proudness. <coughs> Sorry. The other part is that, and it's probably the most important part, is that there is no judgment placed and no disadvantage because you're in a female body. That's the whole feminist project, that you're not disadvantaged because you're women. And that's what feminism as a project, because I like to think of it as a project, has fought for since the beginning of it. I mean, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, she wrote The Second Sex, and what she did early, when was it? Early 1900s almost, maybe late 1800s even, as early as that. She had a look at all the roles that a woman plays in her life, from when you're born right to when you die and the different roles you play. And she was looking for a place where, a place and a role and an age where a woman could feel equal and equal to men and not inferior. And she couldn't find a place. And that was long ago. And maybe it's different now, but maybe it isn't. And that was the beginning of feminism. Just having mm. a look at why the difference. So, 
feminism is around just it's, yeah just to sum up it's it's just around not being disadvantaged because of the body you're in basically but it is completely misconstrued if i walk into a class walked in two weeks ago mba lectures that i teach on women in leadership so i've got 30 women and two men in my class and i say the first day put up your hand if you're a feminist how many hands do you think not many not one yeah only <laughs> mine and then i ask what do you think of feminism feminists are aggressive they hate men they burn their bras that thing has stuff uh, there's this whole misconception around what a feminist is and i say okay this is how I see feminism and what the literature shows about feminism. And these are the waves that we've had. We've had three waves of feminism. We're in the third wave now. First wave was very much about um, just getting the vote. That was the very first wave of feminism. Feminism. And if you look at the cartoons around that time, there's a beautiful cartoon around this man sitting holding a baby and this woman like in her like long dress and this banner, we hate men, we want the vote. <laughs> And he's sitting holding the baby and feeding and the baby's screaming and the kids are running around. And what they were doing is, um, is appealing to the fear that sat behind if women got the vote. So if women got the vote, our lives were going to change as men. We weren't, women weren't going to be nurturing. They were going to be out in the world. Yeah, so that's the first wave. Second wave was around equality in the workplace. That was the 60s. And that's when the whole burning of the brass is, like equal work, equal pay. That was the big thing. And the third wave where we are now is really much more at the conversational partnership level with men. Because we had to get to this stage of how do we have real conversations and partnerships with men. So, but the issues of our day are trafficking and abuse and all sorts of those issues. Because the others are meant to, we've all, mostly we've got the vote, but in some countries still not. Mm -hmm. um, mostly it's equal work for equal pay but still not so those are carrying on and then where we're at now is how do we look at the big social issues as well but in partnership so that's the, that's the challenge mm. I don't know if that makes sense yes okay. very much and very much to me so feminism if I looked at the the, the one definition that kept coming up yeah. in all my research and that is a feminist is a person who believes in the social, political and economic equality of the sexes yeah. So it's very much, it's yeah. not about um, advancing one sex mm -hmm. over the other. Not at all. It's about being equal yeah. and understanding, like you say, it doesn't matter what body we're in, but if you can do the job, then, then do it. And it should be for equal yeah. pay and, and respect should be across, yeah. across genders. We should respect each other no matter what our gender is. So the conversations I think we should be having around the space are more based on what are our strengths. If there's a partnership, even at home or at work, what are our strengths and who's playing to your strengths? Instead of saying, well, you're the man, you need to earn the money, and you're the woman, you will stay at home. If, if you're in a partnership and you've got children and you both want to work, then there's certain jobs that have to be done, but they should not be based on your gender. They should be based on, well, who likes washing and who likes drying, basic things like that. Uh, mm. And the other thing that I'm, that I'm really seeing a lot is We've done more work in the workplace in terms of equality than we've done at home. So I'll okay. have women in my class who are high-powered, high-powered executives, and they can hold their own. They would sit in this boardroom and they would hold their own on every level. At home, when they get home, if they don't do the meal, they feel that they're not a good wife because they, they're being judged by themselves sometimes as well, and not mm -hmm. only their partners, they're being judged on that you need to cook because you're the woman. And if you don't cook, you're not a good wife and he is going to get another wife. So that's, that's what's playing in the back of their heads while they're sitting in the boardroom being incredibly powerful. Yeah. So the work at home is, and the conversations are at home are the conversations we should be having. Uh, I mean, as well as at work, but I think the, the conversations between our close partners of questioning ourselves and them about why do we do certain things and whose voices are in our heads mm. and what model are we using? Are we using a model from last generation where one person often did stay at home and one person went to work? Mostly the male went to work, mostly a female stayed at home. 
And that worked, by and large, except if both of you wanted to work. Or in some such, you know, circumstances, for the lifestyle that people live, they need, both need both to work. Need to work. I mean, there's sometimes yeah. there's a, well, the kind of job that they have, they need two incomes yeah. to, to make ends meet. So yeah, so it's very interesting. So, so that, that's what I wanted to move to then was the, the kind of conversations mm. we need to be having with this. And for me, a key point is that it's not just a woman that should be having a conversation with other women. No. It's that we actually need to be engaging mm. with men and men with women yeah. and you know the broader community about these issues because it's, it's not about you know, one sex over the other. It's how do we work together to have mm. more equality and... So everyone can, as you say, play to their strengths and contribute yeah. to this world. So, so if that's like a, that kind of conversation we need to have, and it's my sense is some people find it quite challenging because it, it can be very emotional. It mm. deals with a lot of very deeply rooted conditioning. Like we brought up so much, mm. like in terms of gender roles, from from young children, and the media just plays into yeah. it. So, so what, what are some of the skills that we need then, or the you know the mindsets, the beliefs that would help us have these difficult, mm. yet most rewarding, I think, yeah. conversations? I think one of them is is trying to see the other person's perspective, but understand, um, almost try and be so open-minded and understand where they're coming from, but test their assumptions. And I had a conversation with my son, he's 21, and it was so interesting. We went out for lunch, which we love to do, and there was a young girl that walked past. She must have been about 18, 19, and she was lovely. And she had these very short white shorts on. And he was like, which <laughs> a young boy is going to do, or any boy. <laughs> Even I was like, wow, she's like very beautiful. I was looking, and that's okay. And... Um, he said, you know, I didn't say a word, because he's like, sweet. So he said, you know what, Mom? If that was my girlfriend, I would not let her, these are his words, I would not let her out like that. And I carried on eating this burger Sundays. I carried on eating my burger. I said, really? And this child's been brought up in a home of where my husband and I really worked hard at this equality thing. We really had conversations after conversations about trying to establish what the hell is going on here. And, I, and when he said that, I was like, oh, my word. So I said, just... The co so the, to answer your question, the, the conversation I had with him, previously I would have had a really judgmental thing of, why are you saying that? And how can you say that? And mm. you, you almost get defensive like sometimes. I get defensive, yeah. like, you know, who do you think you are? Do you think you own her? And I said, boy, explain to me what. Explain to me what and how. Like, how are you seeing the situation? Why are you saying that? But it was such a beautiful conversation. And he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't know why, because these things are deep-seated. Mm. So he can't know the reason why. But he just said, um, I don't want, basically what it is, he didn't want other people looking at her like he was looking at her. And it, I just left it with him. I said, okay, it's an interesting thing, but do you think it would be for you to decide how she dressed going out, or would it be for her to decide? I said, I suppose it would be for her okay. to decide. I said, exactly. Mm. It's, it's not for you to decide. And, and the, that started the conversation. And it's around calling the behavior, and calling sounds quite a harsh word, so it's not calling, it's around examining the behavior, all of our own behavior in it's the moment. I call it making it conscious. Yeah. It's almost like putting it mm. on the table just so you can look at it. Yeah. yeah. So you can look at it and say, Sure, but what happened is just very interesting. Mm. So we're having a bright tonight, and I mean, as you've seen, our team is really nice team and it's completely mixed. And our boss is, it's, he's hosting it at his house. And he was just telling me this morning what a dilemma he's got because he was so nervous to say, okay, the boys go buy the meat and the girls make the salad. He said, that's so stereotypical. <laughs> and I said, actually, we, it would have been fine for us either way. We don't really mind. But he's sensitive enough to know that it could maybe have been an issue because it's such mm. a stereotype. Mm. And to have a man close to me, like in this working situation, that's thinking like that, and we can have the conversation, we can really examine it. Mm. That's your point. Yes. If we're making it conscious and go, 
what the hell? What? Why are we? Why are we why okay with like that? that? No, why? Why <laughs> default rent that? <laughs> and and why did it go like that? But unless we have mm. relationships where we have a conversation and we put it on the table, we'll just continue defaulting. Mm. And so for me also part of then of being able mm. to have those conversations is is the strong sense of, of ourselves that we don't as we as they get that defensive and that judgmental mm. and take mm. it personally. And understand it's just a different world world view, yeah. you know, that's deeply ingrained in society as as a whole. Yeah. And that it's yeah, if do you mean to, to challenge on ourselves also then to be willing to challenge our own thinking and yeah. not beat ourselves up for it mm. or feel defensive but say, oh, that's, like you're saying, that's interesting because when yeah. you have that approach, it's much easier to, to start mm. dissecting it and I often find awareness is the, the starting point of any change. Mm. Half the work is done when you're just aware of yeah, that's your true. own programming. When you're just going like, I wonder why that hooked me. What, what about that was fascinating, yeah. 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 But if you... When I, I studied um, feminism years and years and years ago at in Liverpool, and the one when you, when you come to the subject the first time, and we, I started reading about it and really getting involved in it, and I don't know why we never know why we get drawn to something. It's mm. we need to learn. And I started reading about it, and then you start seeing it everywhere, like everywhere. And I went to one of my lecturers and I said, "This is completely freaking me out," I, because you start seeing it. It, it just looks like someone's, I don't know, the world looks different. And she said, it's okay, don't worry. It's like when you first start reading about it, it's like someone's put a spotlight on that. And you mm. see it in every interaction. You start thinking every single thing is tainted with it. And maybe it is, but eventually that, that fades, fades a bit. A bit and, right, yeah. um, so I, I used to be quite, quite harsh and judgmental about it. And now I'm very... Mostly, I think mostly with myself and with other people, I'm just very curious about where it comes from and where those sites of um, prejudice, because it's a prejudice, where the sites of prejudice are and in ourselves, mm -hmm. where they sit. So then part of the mindset then for us to develop then is that curious mindset. Mm -hmm. I think curiosity is yeah. a very useful way of looking yeah. at the world because like, I wonder how and why or you know, how that functions or where yeah. and what's going on. <laughs> what's going on for me or what's going on for that other person mm -hmm. that that he or she thinks it's okay to say that or do that. What's happening for them? Uh, but mm. you know, we've got a lot of unlearning to do. We've got four thousand years of patriarchy. So we've got mm. a lot of a lot of unlearning and a lot of different weaving to do. Uh, and the and I think we've had this conversation around a lot of the work is around how do we nurture the feminine in all of us that we can balance the masculine. Because we so, all of us have been so programmed to be really good with our masculine energy. Like you get stuff done and you goal orientated and you're focused and you've got a plan and all those very strong, wonderful masculine traits. Mm, very useful. And how do we balance and nurture this, this feminine side of all of us to balance that? Then just describe a bit about the yeah. feminine, just so people understand the difference. Okay, so the feminine energy in, in my experience and understanding of it is your more nurturing, holding, gentle energy. If we're going to give these energies names, mm. which already is an interesting concept, but say we go with the masculine is the goal orientated focus. The the feminine energy is the holding, caring, nurturing energy that we can go for a goal, but not at any, not at all costs, because we've got a feminine energy that that holds and and judge and sort of judges it, manages it, and goes, hang on, let's just, it just is this for the good, is this for the greater good? Mm -hmm. It's the greater good energy. So within men and women, that feminine energy, the more comfortable we get with it, I think the the more we'll balance this incredibly strong masculine energy that we've got. Mm. Yeah, that's what I think we're really going to. And that's probably the real, real conversation, is how do we balance those two True. to work properly. And, and almost, for me, it's like a, like a tool 
kits or, a, you know, resources that we've mm. got. They, they're both useful and we need to be using them and not be one way or the other yeah, way. Right. The, the extremes of anything leads yeah. to extreme behavior in a situation. So having the ability within ourselves to access both mm. masculine and feminine ways of being, being able to apply them when the situation yeah. needs it is, which I think would be a great skill yeah. to, to develop. And it kind of relates to another thing that I read, the, um, in terms of thinking of, instead of identifying, maybe just to mm. touch on, on, I think when we bring our, we relate our identity to something, it's when it's much easier to become defensive and then close-minded okay. because it's about it. So if we, like, I know we, we use the language very freely, say, like, like you asked in your class, mm. who here is a feminist? Very nice, so I'm a feminist. Um, the one study they did, and I'll put it in the show notes, um, and was they, they rather asked all the students they had to hold up signs and take photos of, you know, um, how, who needs feminism? Okay. You know what I mean? And, so, and, okay. and then and I got the class to think more about feminist being, feminism being a, a toolkit or a way of thinking, mm. a way of being versus an identity. Identity. So I don't know if you've got anything to add to, um, to, to it as, a, as remembering that that if we think of feminism as about equality between the sexes, mm. it's a way of being and a toolkit. It's not who we are. So, so it's not an identity thing. I think in a way it's, it's all of that. Because if you are using the toolkit and you are being that, you're probably quite quickly going to be able to be comfortable yeah. with identifying, the identi it. identifying it. Yeah. And, and it's, because once you are that, I don't know if you can be any other way. You know, once you've used the toolkit and you're being like it all the time. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I hear you about the attaching to an identity because almost that becomes, can become a self-fulfilling thing and you just keep on doing that because you don't want to look at anything else, you know. Um, or if I could just say, in, in yeah. if that identity has been perceived like feminist today is perceived as mm. the man bashing, mm. bra burning, you know, aggressive woman. Yeah. People don't want to identify with that. They don't want to, whereas, you know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. it just, the reluctance of people to put their hands up might be because they're misunderstanding and, and the common perception is so negative. I don't know. Yeah, it's no, no <laughs> it can, it's absolutely that because there's a, but then does that make the, does that make the um, the identity sort of a wrong thing because there's a misconception? So, um, yeah. So for me, it doesn't. It just yeah. means that people are not educated mm. enough on, yeah, on on what it is. But it is around. I think what you, the, the, your point is, and what I'm hearing is, it's around not getting completely attached to a label and an identity. Mm. Um, I know I'm a feminist, but if somebody talks to me about it, I'm not aggressive about it because it's such a way of being. For me, it's like being a woman or being white or being a South African. That is me. That is who I am mm. in my core. And it, I can kick and scream and shout and say, I'm not that, but I am that. Uh, and if people don't like South Africans, they don't like women, there's not much I can do about it or want to change it anything about yeah. it. I don't know if we're talking. Yeah, we might be talking yeah. in circles. Yeah, we might be talking <laughs> in circles about but, it. But besides that, yeah, yeah. Just, just to reiterate, you know, the point is that feminism is a way of being. Mm. I think if we're just mm. too quick to say, you know, I'm a feminist and, and, ident and not actually understand what it is, and yeah. I suppose it comes out that congruency. So I know I speak about that in, in some of the shows. Um, if you are a feminist, you need to be living it, and to live it mm. means be questioning your your conditioning that pops yeah. up, um, and be willing to ask other people and put up boundaries where you need and challenge status quo, and treat others as you would want to be treated equally. Yeah. And sometimes to let things go as well. I think yeah. that's who we are. Sometimes to notice and go, okay. I don't think I'm going to be able to change the entire world. What can I do? And which which are the conversations I'm prepared to have right now? 
I'm also okay with that with myself at the moment because at one point I was thinking every time you see something you need to address it you know that very like fiery feisty mm -hmm. person and I found it much more much more constructive just waiting for the right moment to have a conversation and watching for a pattern and if there's a pattern in behavior I can address it and go you know I've seen I've noticed this pattern and I'm not sure what the meaning of the behavior is um, can you help me understand it? Because else I'm going to project some other meaning of my own mm. Mm. onto the behavior. Meanwhile, that person's got a completely different meaning. Whereas in the path, I would probably react to the very first thing and put my judgment on it. But maybe that's not what they mean at all. So it's a great way to, you know, if we're talking about yeah. the skills we need to have this conversation is with that curiosity mindset, is, is not to jump in. Yeah. Wait for a pattern and then comment on the pattern and ask first. Yeah. Because um, that's for me is a key part of confrontation. Any kind of confrontation mm. is asking, like I'm noticing mm. these things. What's going on for you? Yeah. And getting the information before you you, you jump to yeah. to a conclusion. And before you project your own meaning onto that behaviour. Yeah. You can always shout this, and from my perspective, it looks mm. like, but mm. it's, that's also about owning. Yeah, Only our own perspective. And those skills are, are exactly the type of conversation we can be having. We're using the skills for this, for, for feminism and for gender equality. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. I don't think the skills are different for this, for this issue. No, no. Just general conversational and confrontational Patient, skills. Yeah. Yeah. So is there anything else that you would add then from, from just knowing you know, about confrontation and conflict and that we could then apply to having these conversations? Just, just the one thing that I have noticed that's incredibly powerful, and this might seem like a generalization first, forgive me for that one, but I have noticed that most of the women I work with and are friends with sense intuitively when there's something going on. Um, and some men do, but mostly the women do. And what they, what they are quite shy in doing and loathe to do because they don't know how to do it is to call what they're sensing mm -hmm. and they get uncomfortable say we're having a meeting and there's something happening they know there's something happening here but mm -hmm. they're not sure what it is um or maybe they even are sure what it is but sometimes they're not sure what it is and they just be quiet meanwhile they've sensed a dissonance in the energy and what i've noticed people who are really powerful do you go hang on a minute there's something happening here and I'm not sure what it is is it just for me that it's happening or is it for anybody else and they put it on the table and it's like people go oh, what about good work someone called what it is? so it's about calling it it's about calling what we see putting it on the table yeah putting making it, it table. conscious so that it's yeah and whether that is at home because I think especially at home mm -hmm. or whether it's at work it's about calling it and women generally uh, need to get the confidence because there's a confidence around calling it. And, and there's a confidence and then there's a toolkit of how to call it that it doesn't come out like a complete attack and it just comes out as a, as a mirroring or a reflection. Or like I'm noticing something weird mm. is going on here. Is it just me? And then maybe it is just you, yeah. you know? So for me, part of that mm. mindset then, besides the curiosity mm. and, as you say, having I mean, the confidence, you know, yeah. a bit of guts there, a bit of courage, yeah. you know, to put it on the table, is um, the two things. One is that being vulnerable. And yeah, vulnerable is actually has a lot of power. Yeah. Like, as you say, it's, it's very mm. often powerful women that do it. So the, the other part, I think, I've just remembered, is about being fallible. So okay. as, I think as you were saying, it's yeah. like, I'm not sure if I'm right or not, but I'm sensing something yeah. I trust myself enough to trust my gut that I'm willing to put on the table, but I could be wrong. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's like that tentative offering, making a conscious, and then asking for feedback. That's right. Because that's what you like. Sometimes you kind of, that for me is also useful because you learn more and more to trust yourself when you put mm. on the table, and then if people around you say, actually, no, that's something yeah. else, or you're right, I'm so yeah, glad you right. called it, we get to get much more in tune with what you, mm. you were calling that, that mm. intuition. So it's, the fallibility, willing to accept that we could be wrong. Yeah. And it's not the end of the world if you're wrong, mm -hmm. but it's feedback to help develop that yeah. skill. 
Turn the table. It's very important because I think sometimes we develop the confidence to put up the table that we think we're completely right. But there's 10 other people around the table who are seeing it completely differently. And that's mm. okay. That's okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's okay. And sometimes it's like they may pick it up, but they may see it as something totally mm. out. Exactly. And you were just a bit off, but you knew something yeah. was there, but just off on naming it or something. And it might just be your own thing. Yeah. You know, it might just be something that from your own experience and not, not true for them at all. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. Which for me is still useful feedback because then I always say, okay, that's something I can go and work yeah, on now. Exactly right. You know, self coach yeah. or speak to a mentor or someone. Yeah. Or next time I have that feeling, maybe just go out for a bit and come back and sort myself out. Yeah, yeah. Just double checking. Great. So maybe then as we start to, to wrap up, okay. I mean, if you think of anything else then, but I just, you know, I know you've shared a lot about yourself. I just wanted to ask you, like, how feminism has shaped your life then? I know you, obviously, you, you read okay. a lot, you lecture it, you um, got really, like, fussy and excited okay. about it, and, and now you kind of, it sounds like, matured in it and, and found out how and when to have, you mm. know, conversations for the most impact. But how, is there any other way you feel it's shaped your life or you see it in the future shaping it? I think it's completely shaped my life since I since I discovered it. Uh, so it it was probably that that gave me the confidence to follow my own heart around leaving a, a marriage that was 28 years old, and was wonderful in terms of bringing up children and being friends. But our partnership wasn't working, and I don't think without feminism and without really believing in my own ability. Because what that helped me do was always have a job that I could support myself. So it helped, that helped me right back then. So it put me in a position where I could make a choice. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's given me choices. And for that, I'll be forever grateful for it. It's given me choices to make sometimes decisions that I know if, if I didn't believe in it and I didn't read the stuff and I didn't, it wasn't my way of being, I would probably never have had the courage to, to follow what was true for me. So, yeah, it's been amazing for me to mm. be able to do that, I must say. So, yeah, and, and yeah. in my language, that is, is mm. it helps you be more real, be more yeah, authentic and, and, as you say, yeah. true for you. I used to stand up in class and teach all these beautiful things and know inside myself that it's wonderful, it's coming out your mouth, but you know you should be doing something that takes a lot of courage and you're not prepared to do it. And eventually, like, you know, you are prepared to do it. You need to change this thing. Yeah. Mm. So it has helped me be more authentically me. Oh, that's great. Scared sometimes, <laughs> completely. <laughs> so, so it's great then. I've really um, given you, as you said, that toolkit sound like and the journey helped you build up mm. the, the courage mm. in that to, to then be more you yeah. today. So maybe to, just to, to end off then, if, you, if there was a parting message to give to anyone you know, listening to us, what would be your... Your parting message to them. You know, a lot of people say, follow your heart. But I think that's quite a dangerous thing to do if you don't follow it up with something about your mind and your hands. So your heart can lead you in one way, but make sure you've got the facts and you've got done your pros and cons and you've done your, your, your homework before you make a decision, and then actually do it. So if your heart's leading, then... Have your head be closely behind it, and then your hands to actually do the work. So it's not just follow your heart. There's a whole bunch There's of other things. stuff around. M it. Much more holistic. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Don't just jump in and follow your heart. It can end completely tragically if you don't do your homework. Yeah. So, so do your homework, and but then still take action at yeah, some take point. Action. Yeah. Take action. Take action. And do what's true for you. Mm. Um, but don't be don't be naive with it. Uh, be astute in terms of knowing what you're getting yourself into and, and can you actually do that? Can you get into that? Um, Great. Well, thank you for being so real and, and sharing with us today. Thank you very much, Talana, for chatting. Yeah. This was great. Thank you. This was Let's Talk Communication. For more information about the show and my guest, Desiree Clark, please go to talkcommunication.innercoaching.co.za and do let me know how you're finding the show and if you have any suggestions or questions. Thanks for listening and keep it real. Mm -hmm.